All right, so welcome to Math 119 Free Trial. This is lecture six. The first 20 minutes is gonna be a math review. The first year I was teaching at Williams, I taught differential equations in the spring. And at Williams, we do not require linear algebra as a prerequisite for the course, but it should be. And don't mind that this is being recorded. There's a lot of things in differential equations where if you know some basic linear algebra, you can do a lot more. And I needed just some basic facts about two by two matrices. And so I asked the class, does everybody remember and understand two by two matrices? Silence. Does anybody want a review of two by two matrices? Silence. So everybody is finding the two by two matrices. All right, okay. I was using clickers that semester. And so I said, I'm just curious. I'm not gonna report the results to the class, but I'm just curious. How many of you want a review of two by two matrices? Press one for yes, press two for no. I never said I wouldn't report it to other classes. 43% of the students wanted a review of two by two matrices. 0% were willing to say that they wanted a review. So almost surely in any class that you have, if there's something that is not clicking, something that you want to just see more of, you'll know, speak up. Almost surely other people, they may roll their eyes, but secretly they will be grateful that it is asked. And so that's why I want you to just have an opportunity like this. If you want to do it anonymously, you can send it to me through the chat. I will try to monitor that with everything else that's going on. Okay, so let me just quickly show what we were doing and I will open it up to questions. Okay, so we talked a little bit about trying to model real populations. And this was a pretty simple model where we cared about how many were born, how many were one, how many were two, or how many were three. You always gave birth to the same number. And then you die after four years. And so we could write this in matrix form, but we don't have to. You know, we have formulas for how many you have in each at time n plus one as a function of how many you have at time n. So if you have, um, Microsoft Excel, you know, very simple program like that. Um, I can just open this up right now. A new file. And so let me go from the share screen. And so what we could do is we could have this as the A column, the B, the C, and the D. And we'll have over here your time. So we'll start off at time zero. And then how many wheels do we have of each time at time zero? Is that given in the problem? So we get to choose. How many wheels would you like to have been just born at time zero? Two. So we'll do two pairs. Okay. How many wheels do you want to have that were one year old? You better not give me zero for B, C, and D. You know, this is not spontaneous generation of wheel. I need at least a one or a two year old. Three. How many for C? Four. And how many for D? Well, I was going to do 2,000. It doesn't really matter because what's going to happen to everybody in D? They're going to die. Okay? So now I want to figure out how many there will be at each moment in time. So I can just go equals the previous plus one. And if I do just like a downfill, that will just move the year up one at a time. Now, if I want to figure out how many wheels there are that are going to be one year old, how would I do that in terms of the row above? So what would this cell be? This is the number of wheels that are one year old at year one. How do I figure that out? Yeah, it was the number that was born in the previous year. So this equals the value in the A spot one year earlier. And what about the number that are going to be two years old? Same thing. 
with the, with the I assume, shift over by one, and, oops, and similarly, the shift over by one. And now the hard part is figuring out how many are here. And I think it was for every wheel that's one year old, it gives birth to two. So I take that value, multiply by two. And then I take all the ones that were over here and I multiply by one. Do I have to put in the multiply by one? No, but this way when I'm looking at it, I can see where these numbers are coming from and that it's the reproduction. And if I want to change the value, it's a little bit clearer. So now this gives me the second year. I could, of course, now start to try to find year two, or oh, I'm sorry, we start in year zero, by going up here and playing this game again, and I should get 10. But it's much faster to use Excel's command, you know, control D to fill down. And it's gonna start generating. And so by doing that, I don't have to keep copying the formula once at a time, I can just fill up the whole thing. If I wanna do more and more rows, is it gonna be a problem? I just fill down further. What information might you want to have that's not here, but it's easy to get? Total number. And how would we get the total number? Yeah, just add. So equals sum and then parentheses. And you can see the population of the will is growing. Let's go a few more rows. What do you think? <laughs> it's too big. These numbers are not So let's make things make things make things. Now, if I do that, and then they start exploding. <laughs> And so you know, very quickly, um, I've gone up to you know, a little bit less than 400 years. We already have about 10 to the 77 wheels. To put things in perspective, there's somewhere between 10 to the 80 and 10 to the 90 subatomic doohickey what we call single bigs in the universe. And we're already almost reaching that. Does this cause you any concern? Yes. How would you try to figure out how fast the wheels are growing? How would you plot this? What would you want to plot? You could graph it on the total? Like yeah, so, the so I would graph maybe n versus total. And so I'm going to just copy the stuff over here just so it's clean. I'll go all the way down, but this is going to be disastrous. And so, uh, can somebody let the people in in the waiting room? Uh, I just need to admit them so I can actually see my screen again. Okay, so now if I want to use data. I'm looking for the plot function. You do insert. Yeah, it's insert, and then you'll see chart. Okay, yeah. there it is. Thank you. And so I can do a chart, and I'm going to just chart you know the first couple of values. Thank you. And so ideally, I should actually have a label and whatnot. When you look at this, can you tell the functional form of this chart? It looks like, what's the exponential rate? Is it easy to tell? Looks like two to the end. Or... I mean, what you could try to do is you could say, well, look, at year 16, I'm at maybe 20,000. I started off essentially at zero. Maybe try to use that to get the rate. Another way to really understand plots like this is, um, Starting off in year zero is going to be a little bit bad. I'll change this to year one. And then what I'm going to do, 
No, not yet. I'll, I'll shift things like this. I'm going to make this the log of this year plus one. I just don't want to take the log of uh, when I hit when when somebody tried to join it actually equals the log of this year plus one, and this will equal the log of the total number of reals. And I'll fill this down. So this, I'm doing the log log transform of the data because I want to show you how things look when I do a log log transform. Now instead of having things going all the way up to 10 to the 77, now it's only going up to 77. And so rather than seeing that exponential graph, you can see how the graph has now changed. There's lots of different ways you can do it. This is taking the logs of both of them. I could just take the log of the result and not the year. Uh, professor, if you, if you uh, just double click on the bottom right part of the cell, then it'll fill all the way down for you. You don't have to drag it. Ah, thank you. Uh, can you email that to me so I remember that for the future? Sure. So when I look at this, I'm now keeping the year as is, but I'm taking the log of the output. What kind of curve does this look like? It looks like a line. And so using the famous chuck box test, you take a, you know, anything that looks straight, you put it up against it, and it looks very, very linear. And from this now, I can actually get the slope very easily. This is not a proof, but by just looking at the data in the right way, I can really see a lot of the relationships very easily without going through the advanced math and solving. I can see it does look like the log of the total population is growing linearly with the year, and I can estimate that very nicely now by finding the slope of the line. So the point is for a lot of these models, it's wonderful when you have a theoretical closed form solution, because then you can see what happens if you change some of the parameters. But for many of them, it's completely deterministic, and you can just go through and run things. And so we can run the calculation like this, and if I change the different values, not a problem. Also, right here, I've hardwired the formula that it is times two and times one. I could put random variables there. So it just chooses something randomly each time and would generate a move. So even just being able to do some basic stuff in Microsoft Excel, or Google Sheets, you can do a lot of problems that are worth doing. Any other questions on trying to do calculations like this? So this is the advantage of, we don't have to be able to solve everything, we just need to be able to code and share a lot of it. Okay, so I'm now trying to find the slideshow. So the next thing we did was we talked a little bit about a model for rabbits and foxes. And again, in this model, we only care about how many there were at time n to figure out how many there are at time n plus one. As a nice problem, you could try to generalize this model and have it depend a little bit. And maybe that would be your way of taking into account the age of the rabbits and the age of foxes. You know, do you think the newborn foxes are immediately preying on the rabbits? I don't know, maybe we have an accelerated program for, you know, fox prodigies to get them into the field quickly. But, you know, you can, you know, put in little tweaks like that. In terms of solving things, it's going to make the equations much worse. But in terms of using what we did in Microsoft Excel, it's not going to be a problem at all. You can code this the exact same way and quickly see the solution. And of course, you know, the application of this is to try to have models for COVID and to try to see how the pandemic would spread, what would be the consequences. The more involved your model is, the more features it captures, the more likely you are to capture what's really going on in the world. But the simple models can help give us some sense. And so we said that when we were doing this here, we were able to solve for R in terms of F. We then substituted that in, and then we got a nice equation. And we're going to see a generalization of this equation when we get to differential equations later today. And then we just guessed the solution very similar to the Fibonacci. So difference equations, these are discrete versions of differential equations. They model a lot of things in the world. 
the difficulty is you only have discrete time steps. You don't have a continuous variation. It means the tools of calculus are not available. You know, some of you have already taken three calculus classes. There should be some benefit to learning this much calculus. Right? There's a reason why we're having you do this. We don't have as good formulas for discrete systems sometimes, but a lot of the times we do. And it turns out that we can use linear algebra techniques to solve stuff like this. So we come down to you know, a polynomial like this that we need to solve. Oops. Uh, can't highlight here. Okay. So any questions about how you would solve a system like this? And so if you had it depend on more than just the previous, but maybe the previous two, we could have an extra R here or an extra F here, which would mean the formulas would be a little bit more involved. And then we can start to ask how involved are the formulas going to be? The number of rabbits that are eaten, is it the total number of rabbits that are eaten and you just take a fraction of that? Or do the foxes eat certain fractions more than others? So, so far I have not had success with the TV shows my kids watch and you. I'm going to try Disney movies. Finding Nemo. How many people have seen Finding Nemo? Okay. Uh, if anybody here doesn't want spoilers to the movie, even though it's a Disney movie and it's hard to really give a spoiler, you know, please mute yourself now and don't. What happens in the beginning of the movie? What traumatic event? Nemo gets lost, but before Nemo gets lost, the very beginning of the movie, you know, things look his, crazy and then his mother dies. More than just his mother. All his siblings. His mother. Every other fish gets the eaten. The only egg that survives is Nemo. So when you're trying to see if the predation is constant, do you think maybe the young in certain species are far more likely to be killed. And maybe the parent who is guarding the egg or the nest or whatever is more likely to be killed in defense. So you always want to ask, are these assumptions reasonable? And you, it's very easy to just make the simple assumption, well, uh, just have one fifth the total. But as soon as we start introducing other factors, maybe we can do that. And so my question to you, and I'll make this a Nice homework problem is, what would happen if we try to take into account the age of the population and different predation rates? Would we still be able to solve something like this or would that make the model too complicated? How far can you push something and still be able to solve it? And then the question becomes, what do you mean by solve? Is solve giving me a closed form solution where I give you any year and you can immediately jump to the answer, like the Bernays formula for the Fibonacci number, or what we did over here, where we have the C1 to the n plus C2, 3 to the n. Or does solve just mean we actually have a way to just do the algebra and get a solution? It may take some computational time, but we can plug and chug our way there. You know, there are some things where it is so complicated, we can't write things down in closed form. We can't solve all the equations. Orbits of planets are like that. You, we can approximate and we get really good approximations. Okay. Any other questions on the stuff we've done today or any other stuff that we've done up till now? Okay. So what I want to do now for the rest is I want to do a little bit of an introduction to differential equations. So you have some function which gives you the value of something you care about and you want to know how it changes in time. So do I have any chemistry or physics majors here? Aha, that many, okay. Uh, you might remember in chemistry or physics if you ever took those classes, you have Boyle's law and Charles's law, and you have all these different laws. If I hold this constant, then this is how the pressure and the volume are related. And eventually, if you're lucky, they teach you the ideal gas law, which is just all the laws combined. And then if you specialize and say, this is constant, then you get the special cases. 
And because of that, I no longer know which one is Boyle and which one is Charles. They're just special cases of the ideal graph law. You want to know how things change with time. You know, this is why the class is called thermodynamics, not thermostatics. If everything is constant. It's really not that hard to describe what happens in the future. So I want to give you some kind of equation, and I want to figure out how things change as time evolves. So here's Daniel Bernoulli's smallpox model. It's a really nice one. It's very simple, but it has some powerful consequences. So at any age A, let lambda of A be the rate of infection of the people who are susceptible. What might you want to assume about the infection? It's an infectious uh, disease. So it's an infectious disease. So what might you want to assume? It spreads, right? So. Like you can't you can't get infected twice. Okay, but you, you give me something about lambda of a. Tell me about it. Positive, right? If lambda of a is zero, then nobody gets infected. It's not really worth studying this disease. If lambda of a is negative, I find that quite interesting. So we'll assume lambda of a is positive. How large could lambda of a be? One. You're not going to infect more than hundred percent of the population. Do you think the infection rate should be constant with time or should it depend on time? Which do you think would be easier to study? Constant. Let's keep it as lambda of A to allow ourselves some freedom to allow us to have it depend on time and see if we can handle that. But if you have trouble, then take the special case where the infection rate is constant. Mu of A is just the rate of death unrelated to smallpox. It's all the other causes of death. And what it's saying is basically, if you want, if U of A is how many people who were born, when we start counting things are alive at time A, some of them are going to die. That's coming from the Mu of A. And some of them are going to die from smallpox. That's coming from lambda of A. It's going to decrease the number of people we have by this. And again, we're looking at how many people were born in time zero who are still alive at time A. You are not going to have new people born at time zero all of a sudden emerge three years later. So there's no way to add things to you. Which makes sense. You know, if you look at all of the uh, people who were born in 2010, you know, five years later, we don't have you know, three billion new people being counted. What about uh, the number of students in, say, the class of 2021? Does that only go down over time, as some of you flunk out due to the rigors of Williams? Or decided you want to do something else with life? Is there any way that the number of Williams students can go up? Transfer students. And I know we have some transfer students in this class. We actually have ways, if you look at the class of 2021, the population could increase. You also have people who could decide to take a gap year or just take a, a leap. This is especially happening right now. That's not going to help 2021, but it could help 2022, 2023. The next one, um, so W is going to be the number of people who have been infected and recovered. And so I want to look at how many there are. And so the first part over here, well, I had W of A before, and I'm decreasing by the number of people who just die from causes other than smallpox. And then the mu of A, lambda of A, that's the number of people who were just infected. And then S of A is the recovery rate. So that would be the fraction who were infected and recover, and they're now moving to the recovered population. And so we want to solve this system of equations. And so this was the very simple model he proposed back in the 1700s. And it had a profound impact in terms of how people tried to deal with diseases like smallpox. Okay, the more advanced one is the susceptible infected recovered model that we will you know, talk about in you know, greater detail later. There's just you know, more terms, more equations. You want to get a sense of how much harder does this make everything? 
Sometimes it's just, okay, well, rather than using a two by two matrix, I use a three by three matrix. I can still use the same techniques of linear algebra. It's not a big deal. Sometimes it's, I can still use linear algebra, but I no longer have a closed form solution for the answer. I just have to say, there are roots to this polynomial. The polynomial is degree five. I'll call the roots R1, R2, R3, R4, R5. I can't write them down, but I can approximate them as well as I want. Other times it becomes completely different when you add more degrees of freedom, when you add more dimensions, when you add more quantities that you care about. And you really want to get a sense of what is the cost of adding all these other stuff. Okay. Any questions on what we have done up to now? Yes. Nope, nope, you do not need to say, and it's not, and I'm not going to be insulted if you leave. That's why I, I specifically said um, the first half of the class today is going to be review. The second half is just going into the differential equation. Yep. It is a you know challenge to try to have a class at multi levels, and you're trying to balance the different things. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about solving differential equations. So. Notation is extremely important. Uh, my daughter, as I've mentioned, is taking algebra one, and she actually had her first test, and there were only two questions, and half of the questions were on notation. What do we use for the rep to represent uh, natural numbers, whole numbers, rationals, integers, and reals? Was one of the questions. And interestingly, we were actually talking about this the night before. Does anybody know why we use Q to represent rationals? Quotient. You know, rationals are ratios of integers. Why do we use Z to represent integers? Is X and Y already taken? It was a German word. The German word was not. And so if you look at who was doing mathematics in Europe at the time, you have a lot of French and German mathematicians, not as many of the uh, English. Notation is very important. Think, why did someone choose to do this? The one that pisses me off more than anything else in mathematics is what is one over cosine? Secant. And what's one over sine? Cosine. Wouldn't you want to put cosine and cosecant together? You know, when I get complete power over the universe, that's on my list of to do. Okay? Notation should be good. When you only have one variable in play, we often like to use the prime notation in calculus. Y prime means the derivative of Y with respect to X. And since X is the only variable, it's clear that this is what the derivative is with respect to. If we have more variables, then we have to be careful and then we use the partial differentiation symbols for multivariable calculus. But right now, we're only going to assume that we have one variable X. Dy dx is the more elaborate way to write it to make it really clear we're looking at the change in y with respect to x. So we want to solve the equation y prime of x equals y of x. So we're looking for a function that equals its own derivative. Any thoughts? Zero. Zero. Excellent. And so this is the perfect spot ass answer. So it's fun to say this is a fact. So y of x equals zero works. Anything else? E to the x. So y of, oh, oh, interesting. I've got to be then very careful how I touch this side. Uh, so, hmm. So y of x equals zero, y of x equals e to the x. Why does e to the x work? So one thing is we can write e to the x as one plus x plus x squared over two factorial plus x cubed over three factorial going off to other, or it's the sum n goes from zero to infinity of x to the n over n factorial. And if you can say the derivative of the sum is the same as the sum of the derivative, 
then that will imply e to the x equals e to the x when you just take the derivative term by term. Yeah, the derivative of one is zero, the derivative of x is one, the derivative of x squared over two factorial becomes two x over two factorial, the twos cancel. But you have to justify this. And this is not always true. And that requires some math to do this. But if we're willing to just accept that, that the derivative of e to the x is e to the x, we have a solution. Are there any other solutions other than zero and Two e to the x. What else? Constant e to the x. Constant e to the x. So the general solution is y of x is some constant times e to the x. And we might write this as e to the x y of zero. Just you know, what the value is at times zero. And that's the most general solution. And again, this is not a full course in differential equations, but it's worthwhile just seeing a little bit of the stuff. We have a derivative of degree one, and so there's one free parameter. What do you think would happen if we had a derivative of degree two? We should have two free parameters. And that could be maybe the value of the function at time zero and the value of the derivative at time zero. And the more derivatives you have, the more initial conditions you need to you know, completely specify what happens. It's fortunate that for a lot of math and physics, we don't really need to go beyond the second derivative in a lot of the equations that arise. All right, so what if we consider something a little bit more general? Y prime of x equals a y of x. What would be the solution now? E to the ax. Now, imagine you didn't see that, but you know, God, through a representation in class, has said, thou shalt try y of x equals e to the ax. We can just try it. So we can guess y of x is e to the ax, and then y prime of x is a e to the ax, which is a y of x. And that works. Is this the most general solution? Yeah. So we could put a constant. So better would be y of x is e to the ax times y of zero. Now I want to do something that hopefully you haven't seen before. So I can be the one to introduce this to you. We have looked at the real problem several times. I like the real problem. And so what we had there was we had, you know, like v n plus one was some matrix A times v n. These are really discrete versions of the differential equation. We could look at y prime of x is A y of x. But now, say y of x is a vector, y1 of x dot 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 yn of x. And a is n by n. So now we have an n by n matrix. Anybody know what the solution is now? The solution is on the screen. You just have to generalize. Is there any choice of n where we know what the answer is? When n is 1, we know what the answer is. It's e to the ax times y of zero if n equals one. Any conjectures? What might you guess? I'm sorry? Yeah, 
So what are the a sub i cells? We have an n by n matrix. It's still the solution. You can exponentiate a matrix. And a lot of this comes down to looking at what you've done before in the right way. So what does it mean to look at e to the u? This is plus u plus u squared over two factorial plus u cubed over three factorial plus dot dot dot. If I put in a square matrix, it's the identity plus a plus a squared over two factorial plus a cubed over three factorial plus dot 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 dot. And you can show that this actually makes sense. Because A is a square matrix, A squared, A cubed, A to the fourth are still going to be square matrices. Because A has bounded entries, you can show when you look at powers of A, it can't grow faster than like the largest element times n to a power, something like that. And the n factorial, uh, so the, the factorials in the denominator are going to grow so fast that it is going to convert. So this will convert for any matrix. And now if you just you know, think about what happened if you had e to the ax, well now I just put a little you know, x at each one of these. Um, and then that would be uh, x squared, that would be x cubed, and so on and so on. And when I take derivatives, you should see that it's going to look like a times what I had before. So I strongly urge you to do the algebra and just see that this will work. It turns out if I give you e to the a times e to the b, this is not e to the a plus b unless basically a and b commute. So in general, you can't just combine the two matrices. But if the matrices commute, you can. These are really good things to think about. And so for the people who are taking this as 312, I want to try to throw some more advanced mathematics for you to think about and just see some wonderful formulas. There is a beautiful formula for how you compute something like that. But it's a nice generalization of what we had before. And that's one thing that I want you to get. If you can satisfy or solve a simple case, can you figure out how to extend that to something more complicated? And the more complicated has the same functional form. My y is equal to a, my y prime is equal to a times y. The only thing that changes now is that a is a matrix. And we can talk about exponentiating the matrix. Okay. Um, I'm going to just go back and just quickly use this piece of paper to just drive home one point. I'm going to give you three functions f of x and ask you for their derivative. So I'll do x squared, x to the three halves, and x to the square root of two. So what's the derivative of x squared? Two x. The root of x to the three halves. Three halves, x to the one half, and x to the square root of two. So everybody got that right. How do you find the derivative of x squared? What do you use? And so how do you prove the power rule? Definition of the derivative. So you're using the limit as h goes to zero of f of x plus h minus f of x over h. And then you use the binomial theorem. Or maybe Pascal's triangle. It's fully spelled. And you could look at, you know, x plus h squared is x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. So that's how you would take the derivative of x to a power. If you try to do it for x to the one half, you have trouble. How do you expand x plus h to the one half? 
So the standard way you would try to prove it doesn't work in this case. Does anyone know how you prove things in this case? So there's two things you can do. One is you could multiply by one in the form, um, well, I guess we're doing three halves. Sorry. You could do x plus h to the three halves plus x to the three halves over x plus h to the three halves plus x to the three halves. As h goes to zero, the denominator just goes to two x to the three halves. That's not so bad. And the numerator there cancels with the, or reinforces the x plus h to the three halves minus x to the three halves to give you x plus h cubed minus x cubed. So this is one way to do it. The other way is to let g of x be f of x squared, which is x cubed. And now you can work with it. And now that I have the function x cubed, I know the derivative. And so I get g prime is 2 f of x x prime of x. For this one, it's not even clear what it means to raise x to the root 2 power. And the way we do this is we write x to the root 2 as e to the root 2 log x. And we have to use the exponential function. So while the rule is the same for all of them, the method of proof is very different depending on which one we're looking at. And it's worth just emphasizing this because it's typically not done for good reason in an intro calculus class, but you should always be aware of what they're trying to slip under the rug, what they're trying to slip past you. So sometimes we have very different techniques that are needed to get the answer, but the answer does have the same form. And that's exactly what we're seeing over here. Okay, so slightly more involved, what if I gave you the second derivative of y is a times the first derivative of y plus b times y, where a and b are some constants. Does this remind you of anything you've seen before? So where have we seen something like this? The Fibonacci's. The Fibonacci's. So we saw with the Fibonacci that if we made the guess, you know, fn is r to the n, we had something. So maybe we should guess something here. Let's guess y of x equals what? A terrible x, it seems to be successful. So we could guess r to the x, but you know, instead of doing r to the x, let's do e to maybe the rx just because it's nice to write things as the exponential because we know the derivative of the exponential is very nice. We don't have to worry about changing base. And if we do that, then we get, you know, y of x is e to the rx, y prime of x is r, e to the rx is r, y of x, and then y double prime of x, you'll see it's gonna be r squared, y of x. And so you get, r squared y of x equals a r y of x plus b y of x. So you get r squared minus a r minus b times y of x equals zero. So you solve for r squared minus a r minus b equals zero. And then the general solution will be y of x is maybe c1 e to the r1 of x plus c2 e to the r2 of x. And so if I have a differential equation like this with constant coefficients, it's not too bad to solve. And again, the method of divine expression helps you here. There is one situation where you have to be careful about, where this will actually break down a little bit. So I should have two free parameters because this is a differential equation of degree two. I claim that if something happens to this polynomial, this polynomial r squared minus a r minus b has a certain property, I'm not gonna have two free parameters. What do I have to be careful about? Thank you. 
if repeated roots, because if we have repeated roots, then we actually just have the new constant C1 plus C2. And I believe the solution in that case is it's e to the rx, and I believe it's x e to the rx. I believe that's the other one that you need to look at. And you have something very similar when you look at polynomials uh, from different situations. Okay, so now the last thing I want to talk Professor, about. Professor, there's yeah. a question in the chat. Yes. Yeah, I was just wondering where you got the R1 and the R2 from. So these are, so we're going to write this as R minus R times R minus R2 equals zero. So it's the roots of that equation. All right, got it, thanks. And this is called the characteristic polynomial. Any other questions? All right, so we are basically exactly where I wanted to be. We've got five minutes left, and now we're looking at the equation that arose in Bernoulli's work. Y prime of x plus p of x, y of x equals 2. So we had something like that in his model. And we wanted to solve it. And so in general, when you have to solve something, sometimes it's easy to say, well, let me try to solve something simple first. And the simple thing is, imagine if it's, you know, we had the y prime plus y of x. This almost looks like a product group. Imagine instead I had b of x, y prime, or so b of x times y of x, take the derivative of all that equals 2 of x, that would be very easy to solve. I would just have to integrate both sides. And in this case, I would just get you know, b of x, y of x, would be like the integral from 0 to x of q of t dt. And if I take the derivative of that by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I get the figures. So I can pass back and forth between derivatives and integrals in terms of solving it. Since I'm integrating from 0 to x, that's going to give me my arbitrary you know, initial condition, my constant. And this would just become q of x minus q of 0, where q prime of x is little q of x. So I think I've mentioned, have I mentioned the law of the hammer in this class? If all you have is a hammer, pretty soon every problem looks like a nail. Whatever you have given, find a way to convert to something you know. We know how to handle things with the form b of x, y of x, take the derivative of that. So the question is, can I multiply both sides by something to make y prime of x plus p of x, y of x look like it's the product rule? So let's multiply by, say, a of x. So we have a of x y prime of x plus a of x p of x y of x equals q of x. And then the hope is that this is just b of x y prime, sorry, oops, uh, I will eventually figure out it's not letting me do erasing in projection mode. And we're just hoping that it's equal to this. So we want b of x, y of x prime, which is just going to be b prime of x, y of x, plus b of x, y prime of x. I wrote them in the wrong order, so I put these in the other order a of x, p of x, y of x, plus a of x, y prime of x. So when I look at the y primes, I see, okay, b of x should be a of x. And then when I look at the coefficients, oh no. Hold on. Oh well. And now I can't make it erase that, but it's amazing. All right, so 
we want to solve by multiplying by um, a of x to make it look like um, b of x, y of x time. So what do we get? So we would get um, b, I'm sorry, a of x, y of x, a of x, y prime of x, plus a of x, t of x, y of x, equals a of x, q of x. And we want this to be b of x, y of x prime. That's going to be b of x, y prime of x, plus b prime of x, y of x. So this tells us that b of x has to be a of x. And it also tells us that b prime of x, a of x, has to be b prime of x. So we just have to solve b prime of x times a of x is b prime of x. Um, wait a minute. Oh, sorry, no, I'm sorry. B prime of x is supposed to be um, A of x, P of x. Right? So now we just get B of x is the integral from 0 to x of A of t, P of t, dt. And that's going to tell us what v to put in. And so these are called integrating factors. I always forget the formula. It's always easier for me to just either look it up or just quickly re-derive it. But the idea is we start off with an equation we know how to solve. And we try to convert things to that. So for the last thing, if I give you a linear equation, ax plus b equals zero, it's not so hard to solve x is negative b over a. Let's go to quadratic. What's the nicest quadratic to look at? I give you x squared plus c equals zero, so you get x is plus or minus root c. I could generalize it a little bit. I could say maybe ax squared plus c equals zero, and then go to x is equal to plus or minus the square root of c over a. Wouldn't that be if x squared minus c? Oh, sorry, it should be minus. Yes, yes, you're right. It should be minus. And then the next I could do is I could give you ax minus h squared plus c equals zero, and you would get x is equal to h plus or minus the square root of minus c over a. Quadratic in this form, then it's the easiest way to solve it. And so if you've seen the way you derive the quadratic formula, the method of completing the square, that's essentially what we're doing is we're just writing the quadratic in this form. This is a better form for calculating. So this is just a general principle. If there's something that you can do, try to convert anything that you're given to that form. All right, so this is a good place to start. Uh, Friday's class is going to be more of a discussion class, and I will be sending a little bit of reading to you beforehand. Any quick questions before I start the 